n equals two. And are the setting of mirror symmetry uh, heterotic and orientifolds give n equals one and have been uh, semi-realistic starting points for phenomenology. And it's the, the they're the setting in which much of our non-perturbative understanding of string theory has been developed. So, um, okay. Uh, K3 has played a particularly important role uh, because it, it compactifying on it gives even more supersymmetry than a typical clubby L3 fold. Uh, and a concrete way to think about it is as the resolution of a torus orbifold where you negate all the coordinates of T4. Um, and uh, one reason K3 has been so useful is because um, heterotic type two duality uh, uh, involves K3 very essentially. Um, and that is the apparent duality of a vast number of other dualities. Uh, another reason is because one of the um, great successes of, of, uh, of non-perturbative string theory um, involved deep black hole microstate counting um, and that, that, that was in K3 compactifications. So I just list, listed a large number of successes involving Calabiao and specifically K3 compactification of string theory. But remarkably, all of that was achieved without an explicit form of the metric. And indeed, no smooth, uh, compact, non-toroidal, Ricci flat um, metric, Calabiao or otherwise actually, um, was known before our work. And why might this matter to a string theorist? Well, one of the first things we see in string theory classes is the nonlinear sigma model action. Uh, but this G here is not actually known for almost any case that many people talk about. And uh, so, so that obviously limits the sort of quantities that one can compute. Um, one is by necessity restricted to uh, talking about various couplings in low energy supergravity or counting BPS states, um, but but you know there, there there's a wealth of physics in these string compactifications that are just totally invisible to um, the sorts of techniques that have have been in popular use because we don't have these metrics. Uh, and this question is particularly well motivated for K3 as opposed to other Clavier manifolds because the beta function of the nonlinear sigma model is exactly zero. So there aren't alpha prime corrections to the metric. Um, the, the condition for conformal invariance is literally uh, ri the Ricci flatness. Uh, so as an example of our ignorance, um, even for K3, which, you know, as I said, is one of the best studied uh, Clavier manifolds uh, and CFTs more generally, the world sheet partition function is almost is known almost nowhere. Uh, okay, and then uh, this is a physics talk, but uh, I've spent much of the last year uh, turning this into rigorous mathematics. So let me briefly mention some of the mathematical motivation. Um, for a physicist, this might be interesting just because uh, it's always fun to see what, what sorts of mathematical predictions one can um, get out of string theory and sort of use mathematics as a natural laboratory for testing string theory. Um, so, uh, you know, first of all, we're um, going to have a constructive proof that compact non toroidal Ricci flat metrics exist. Um, we'll have a novel proof of Yao's theorem specific for K3 surfaces. Um, uh, in, in, yeah, in interesting generalizations of, of the Donaldson and Lundbeck Yao theorem. Um, uh, interesting connections with mirror symmetry, where we can extract certain open string Gromov wooden invariants of the mirror K3 surface, um, as I'll describe in a bit. Physically, this is going to correspond to uh, teaching us about the BPS spectra of 4D conformal field theories. Um, which whose BPS spectra are not known, as well as compactified little string theories. Uh, and, and then uh, one last um, fun aspect of this project has been that uh, we've, we've been developing some novel analysis um, for uh, proving existence of solutions to certain PDEs with interesting coefficient functions. Okay, so... Uh, what I'm going to tell you about today, though, is just the physical background. Um, so uh, the, the physical idea behind our construction um, and, and uh, that, that will be all one needs in order to actually use the formulas. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're already good to go for doing numerics, for example, uh, 
but turning it into rigorous mathematics is, is, uh, is a bit more work uh, as usual. Um, okay, so uh, we have two classes of constructions. And so I will explain the one that is um, less well formulated first, uh, because there are certain, it, it depends on a BPS spectrum of a little string theory, which is not yet known. Um, and then I will explain how to relate that construction to a second construction, which is completely explicit. And so uh, by relating those two, you can then um, uh, read off the BPS spectra of those li the, the little string theories. Okay, so with, uh, with that motivation, let me jump in. Um, so the physical setup for the, um, for the first construction involves a heterotic little string theory. So uh, there are five brains in, little, in, in heterotic string theory analogous to NS5 brains. Um, they uh, have a decoupling limit, just like NS5 brains. Uh, and from the supergravity perspective, this works because the corresponding soliton is very singular. So there's an infinite throat that develops as you approach the soliton. Um, the string coupling diverges as you approach it. Um, and so it's intrinsically non-perturbative. The field theory, and um, e even as G string goes to zero, the world volume of this five brain remains interacting. Uh, it is not a quantum field theory. Um, for example, it has T duality, so there's no unique stress energy tensor. So there, there's some interesting physics involved uh, with these theories. Um, let me mention how string dualities can be used to, uh, to get a useful picture of the moduli space. Um, so let's start in heterotic string theory on, a, on T2 with a five brain wrapping T2. Uh, S strong weak duality takes us to type one string theory um, with a D5 brain wrapping the torus. And then if we T dualize twice, then um, we get a type 2B orientifold on T2 mod Z2 with D3 brains probing that. Uh, and quantum corrections smooth out this T2 mod Z2 to a CP1. Uh, and, and so we see F theory on K3, um, where the axial diloton is varying over the CP1, you have, uh, and that can be described by the geometry of an elliptic vibration. Um, and the singular fibers are these seven brains. And similarly, if we, instead of being on T2, we want to study the moduli space of the little string theory compactified on T3, uh, we can use T duality three times to replace the D5 brain by a D2 brain. Uh, and now the moduli space gets an extra uh, dimension provided by the M theory circle. And so, uh, uh, the, yeah, this is just another way of um, describing heterotic M theory duality, uh, where the wrapped five brain over here becomes an M2 brain probing K3 over here. And, and so the idea is going to be that the moduli space of this heterotic little string theory is a K3 surface. Uh, and in the limit where um, the, the, one of the circles of this T3 uh, gets very large, the, um, the geometry of this M theory compactification will approximate that of the F theory compactification, this singular elliptic vibration. Uh, and, and so there, there will be, um, we'll, we'll, we'll basically have an expansion about this limit where we'll have controllable small corrections to this geometry. Um, the moduli of the heterotic string theory become parameters of the little string theory, um, which in this dual picture are just the parameters of the K3 metric itself. The gauge symmetry in space-time similarly descends to global symmetry on the little string theory. Okay, so as I said, we're going to study the little string theory on T2 times a large circle S1R, where R is the radius. So in the R to infinity limit, we get this geometry, um, which is has an explicit known Ricci flat metric, but it's singular at these seven brains. So the whole um, idea then is to describe a metric which is approximately identical to this metric away from the singular fibers, but which gets large corrections near the singular fibers. Uh, the corrections away from this limit are determined by instantons in the little string theory. So their action is suppressed by um, the, you know, the instanton action of something winding around the circle. Uh, so, so they're exponentially small in R. Uh, 
Um, and they, the instantons correspond to BPS states in the four-dimensional theory with the theory, the little string theory on T2. So the instanton action is just given by the mass of the, the BPS state in four dimensions times the radius of, of this extra circle. Um, okay, so uh, this is in one slide, the, um, the entire uh, formalism. Um, so I don't, I, every time I've given this talk, I've spent way too long on this slide. So let me try to be somewhat sketchy. Obviously, if you have some questions, I will answer them. Uh, but but I, let me try to give the main ideas. So um, this is a formalism due to Gaido Moore and Knightsky, uh, which we generalized to little string theory. Uh, the idea is that the geometry um, of uh, of a, a K3 surface, or more generally of hyperkähler manifolds, um, can be expressed it, uh, in terms of certain holomorphic two forms, where zeta is the complex it is a, parametrizes a complex structure. So hyperkähler manifolds have a whole C1 worth of complex structures, and if you know the holomorphic two form in every complex structure, that suffices to reconstruct the metric. Um, uh, and one way to see this is that you can um, just expand the holomorph this holomorphic two form um, has a very simple Laurent expansion. It just has three terms. And those three terms encode the three Kähler forms of, of K3. And then just by multi matrix multiplication of those Kähler forms, uh, you get the metric. Um, so, uh, Right, and furthermore, this is um, in a holomorphic sense a symplectic form, meaning it you know you can write it in a sort of holomorphic version of DP wedge DQ, and so uh, the entire um, construction of the metric is reduced to the determination of certain canonical functions on the moduli space, and physically those canonical functions just are the expectation values of su certain supersymmetric observables um, at a point in the, in moduli space. And their holomorphy is guaranteed by supersymmetry, as usual. And so uh, the um, this is now a very familiar problem in physics, determining the VEV of some supersymmetric observable. The idea is just uh, you, you use the fact that you know it's asymptotics uh, in plus holomorphy in order to um, completely constrain those functions. Uh, now, the one hiccup here is that the, um, the observable the observables um, are only piecewise holomorphic because of wall crossing phenomena. And so uh, one needs to, um, uh, yeah, so one needs to account for that. So, but fortunately the types of discontinuities are known very explicitly in terms of the BPS spectrum of the, of the theory. Um, and, and so uh, one can, um, can uh, set up what's called a Riemann-Hilbert problem, which just is the data I just said. You 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 seek a holomorphic, a piecewise holomorphic function with certain prescribed jumps and certain asymptotics, um, and then it's it's known how to solve those. Uh, namely, you write down this integral equation. Um, you start with the asymptotic uh, value um, of that function, which is the the limiting behavior of that function in the large R limit. Um, and then you just plug this zeroth order value of these functions into the right-hand side of the integral equation. That gives you a first approximation. You plug that into the right side, that gives you a second approximation and you keep doing that. And th that iterative procedure will get exponentially better and better and better um, and, and converge to the, to the final answer. Um, so uh, physically, what are these um, Xs? They're, they're um, expectation values values of supersymmetric wilson took point operators wrapping this S1R. Um, so gamma here is labeling the charge associated to these Wilson line operators um, or equivalently, yeah, okay. Okay, so in one slide, uh, that is the Gatto more knightsky formalism. Um, right, so I already said this. Uh, and so, yeah, so the punchline of that slide is we have reduced the determination of a K3 metric to the simpler problem of counting BPS states in a little string theory on a two torus. Um, and uh, thanks to the wall crossing formula. So 
as I said, the, these omegas wall cross, and so uh, they're only piecewise constant, but they, they suffer certain discontinuities. Um, but the wall crossing formula means that um, one only needs to determine the BPS state counts at one point in parameter and moduli space, and then in principle, they're determined everywhere. Okay, uh, so as a first approximation, um, which is already exponentially good because it takes account of the large corrections near the singular fibers and the corrections everywhere else are exponentially small, you can just iterate the integral equation once uh, and you get a very good approximation already, um, which just accounts for the physics of the lightest BPS states. Um, uh, near each singular fiber, which are known explicitly for, uh, for the typical singular fibers, the generic ones. Um, okay, so uh, phys what is uh, a way to picture these BPS states that, that are showing up in these formulas? Um, well, I told you that we could think of the four-dimensional uh, little string theory in a dual frame as a D3 brain probing uh, F theory on K3. So if we think of this as a piece of the F theory base, then and the, each the triangle and the square are each seven brains, and the cir the circle here is a D3 brain, uh, then this is the um, sort of geometry that contributes BPS states in this little string theory uh, that they're PQ string webs. Um, which run along the base of the F-theory vibration. Uh, and this, this problem is particularly nice at points in moduli space with co constant tau, um, co constant um, string coupling, um, because the base is flat. And so that we're just, we have a combinatorial flat surface problem. It's, it's a hard problem the, um, because the base is compact, and so the string webs can wind around and bump into each other, and so you you get very hard, very complicated geometries contributing. But it, you know, in principle, that this is um, rather straightforward. Like you could imagine uh, counting these things up to any given mass cutoff um, just on a computer. Um, okay, uh, so let me specialize further to the orbifold limits. Um, so, uh, 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 right, it, there are certain um, T4 mod ZQ orbifold limits where one can think of this as a T2F vibration over a base, which is itself an orbifold. Um, and, and then th there are a bunch of coincident seven brains at the sing singularities of the base, um, which uh, physically um, correspond to certain super conformal field theories. So a, a D3 brain probing each of these seven brain stacks gives a different type of super conformal field theory. So for in this example, one just gets the SU2 and F equals four CFT, um, four copies of it here. One has some, and, and then in the other examples, one gets some Minahan Nemeshansky CFTs um, as well as the SU2 and F equals four one. Um, okay. so. Uh, Right. Um, so in uh, the n equals two supersymmetry algebra, the mass of a BPS state is given by the absolute value of its central charge. And uh, so uh, there need to be certain abelian global symmetries, which are um, associated to the, to the um, which give BPS states mass when they wind around the torus a bunch of times. Um, and uh, Indeed, one sees those uh, symmetries in the little string theory. Um, right. Whereas for the formal field theories, because the base is non-compact, those charges don't exist, and one can't wind around the base. Um, and also, we see, so in a conformal field theory, the only type of geometry that contributes is just a straight line going from the D3 brain to a singular fiber. But in the little string theory, different singular fibers can um, shoot off strings and, and they can bump into each other. So, so we get more complicated geometries like this. Okay, uh, so, um, right. You, you might be confused why I'm talking about uh, probing these orbifolds folds in, in F theory when I said I wanna make smooth K3 metrics. Um, but the point is that uh, the, the um, as we reduce on this extra circle S1R, there are um, Wilson lines in the uh, string theory 
that, that we can uh, turn on in order to smooth out the orbifold in the dual M theory picture. Um, and so the BPS states of the F theory on an orbifold um, already suffice to determine a large number of smooth K3 metrics um, where, where we turn on the, the, um, these resolution parameters only in the third direction, but not on the first two circles. Um, so, uh, so, so for simplicity, when I'm matching onto the other formalism, I will specialize to those low side just because uh, the formulas are, are much simpler there because there's no wall cross. Um, they're, they're, at the order to which we are gonna work, there, there's not gonna be any wall crossing and um, tau being constant makes things nice and the base being flat makes things nice. Um, okay, so at, at this order, uh, CFT BPS states um, with uh, gauge charge. So M here is the imprimitivity, and then this is the electric and the magnetic charges. Um, they contribute to the holomorphic symplectic form um, via certain functions, certain combinations. So uh, this is where this great grade, these are certain characters of um, the uh, global symmetry of the little string theory. Um, and when I say CFT BPS state, I really mean the states that don't wind around and bump into other states. So the, there, there's some sector in the little string theory of, uh, of the BPS spectrum of the little string theory, which is just the, um, which is just a bunch of copies of the CFT spectra. Um, sorry. So, okay, I just said this. So we'll have many towers of CFT spectra corresponding to strings which start on a seven brain, wind around the base some number of times and then end on the D3 brain. Um, and in contrast with the little string theory spectrum, the CFT spectra are much simpler because they don't wall cross. Um, interestingly, in spite of that, uh, only the SU2 and F equals four BPS spectrum is known at the moment. The minahan nemeshansky CFTs um, BPS spectra are significantly more complicated and um, they're not yet known. Uh, I'll tell you at the end of this talk, uh, we have some new results um, on them uh, and, and working at higher orders in our formalism should allow one to determine those BPS spectra entirely. But at the moment, they're not known yet. Okay, so uh, that's everything I wanted to say about that formalism. Um, the uh, yeah, one, one should think of that formalism as the much harder one. And the one I'm about to tell you about now is the much more easier classical one. And by comparing those two, um, uh, one can then read off the BPS spectra that enter as ingredients in the first one. Um, much, much, you know, much like in uh, mirror symmetry where one compares the pre-potential, um, which is computed classically on one side, uh, with the prepotent with instant on corrections on the other side and then reads off instant on corrections. So this is sort of an open, open string version of that. Okay, so uh, let me start telling you then about this um, hit this classical formalism. So now we're going to study a D2 brain probing a T4 mod ZQ orbifold where K3 is the Higgs branch of this theory rather than the Coulomb branch like it was before. And because of that, there are no quantum corrections. So uh, uh, let me stress that this is a different type. So, so before we were studying an M2 brain probing uh, K3 surface, um, and this vacuum is not just the dimensional reduction of that on a circle. Uh, and the reason is that um, we want a perturbative type 2A string vacuum, um, meaning that there should be no non-abelian gauge symmetry. So there's a half unit of B field on all of the, um, orbifold uh, fixed points, um, at which, which breaks all of the global symmetries down to their abelian parts. Um, and uh, so, so, th so this is a, a different D2 brain. Um, you know, the, the, this is not just a straightforward S1 reduction of the earlier M theory frame. Um, but nevertheless, a non-renormalization theorem tells us that uh, the metric um, on moduli space will, will be the same. And, uh, this might be reminiscent of 3D mirror symmetry, where we have two different theories with different global symmetries. Um, one, and in the infrared, uh, they, they look the same, their Higgs and Coulomb branches agree. And uh, this is not an accident, um, as discussed in this paper. Um, 
this uh, same sort of picture yields the simplest mirror pairs that were studied by Enfield, Gator, and Cyber. Okay, so uh, let me review how one um, obtains moduli space metrics um, on uh, 3D n equals four gauge theories. Um, the superpotential uh, takes this form where phi is the chiral multiplet in the vector multiplet. Uh, whose vev will vanish. So the only role of phi here will be to, will care about its F term equation, which is just mu plus equals zero. Um, the D terms analogously take the form mu r equals zero, where this is some Hermitian moment map. Um, and so then the Higgs branch is just the quotient of the, this space, the minima of the potential energy by the gauge group. Uh, so as, as a warm up, if we take n parallel D2 brains, this is a 3D n equals eight UN gauge theory. Uh, and the, um, the, F, the complex moment map that shows up in the super potential is just this commutator. Uh, the real moment map is these two commutators. Um, and so setting this to zero lets you simultaneously unitarily upper triangularize these matrices. Uh, then setting this to zero further tells you that um, they're, they're uh, actually diagonal. And um, then we can use up the gauge symmetry to, diagonal, to diagonalize them. And the remaining symmetry is the vial group of UN. Um, so that, that uh, indeed gives you the moduli space in N of C2 for, for these uh, D2 brains. Okay, as a more interesting example with half as much supersymmetry, um, we can orbifold C2. So uh, if we have a D2 brain probe of C2, the formalism worked out by Douglas and Moore is to work out, start on the C2 covering space with the D2 brain and its image, and then you impose certain orbifold projections on, on those two different D2 brains. So the starting point is the N equals two theory from the last slide, two, two parallel D2 brains, and then we impose these projections. So uh, we're gonna require that, um, uh, under the Z2 negating C2, um, U and V get negated. And also we switch um, the, you know, the two different brains with each other. So really sigma Zs here should be sigma Xs, the poly um, permutation matrices, but okay, we like this basis better. Uh, and uh, similarly, the gauge symmetry gets re reduced to um, gauge transformations, which uh, satisfy this, re this result, th this projection. Um, so the solutions of all those constraints are given here. Uh, and then again, we, we can just follow the procedure from before. We minimize, uh, we, we solve the F term equation. We solve the um, D term equation. We use up the gauge symmetry. And uh, that tells us um, that we're indeed probing C2 mod Z2. Okay, so uh, now let's uh, upgrade even more ambitiously to an infinite dimensional orbifold, um, uh, infinite order orbifold um, to get a four torus, um, which is regarded as C2 mod Z4. So this is an idea due to Wadi Taylor. Um, so we start with infinitely many D brains, uh, one in you know, e each lattice associated to each lattice site. And then we impose a Z to the four orbifold projection. Um, uh, and the, just working out the um, projections as described on the last slide, uh, you learn that the resulting gauge group is maps from the dual torus to U1. Uh, and um, this is uh, physically quite sensible because um, T duality relates a D2 brain probing T4 to a D6 brain wrapping T4. And so indeed, um, one should expect uh, a U1 gauge theory on the dual torus. Um, and now uh, the hypermultiplets U and V get um, that in, uh, regarded on the dual torus, they uh, define a U1 connection. Um, uh, right, and the um, moment map equations taken together um, can, can be written in, in this way where star here is the Hodge star. So this is just the moduli space of anti-self dual connections um, mod gauge equivalents. Uh, and then furthermore, because we're on a these connections are on a trivial bundle, 
Um, the, this simple um, calculation tells you that uh, anti-self dual connections on a trivial bundle are actually flat. They just have F equals zero. So indeed, we're just studying um, a moduli space of Wilson lines on the dual torus, which is indeed the, um, the same as the original torus. So, so uh, uh, right, okay. The, um, it's physically sensible that we reduce to constant gauge fields um, that you know, we can parameterize the moduli space just using Wilson lines um, because the, all the non-zero modes have palooza klein masses. And uh, similarly, um, the reason for the moduli space being compact is due to large gauge transformations. Okay, so finally, uh, we can put all of those ideas together um, and realize K3 as a resolution of T4 mod ZQ. So we'll orbifold by C2 and then, uh, uh, sorry, orbifold C2 by some lattice and then um, by ZQ. Um, uh, this idea was studied um, in these papers in the 90s. Uh, and uh, so we'll start with a U of Q gauge theory on the dual torus and then impose certain ZQ projections. That, that's the result you get from working this out. Um, so so uh, th this is just, if uh, Yoda here um, denotes a generator of this ZQ action, then uh, this is just saying the pullback of the gauge field under Yoda um, is related to the original value of the gauge field conjugated by some matrix um, and similarly for gauge transformations. Okay, so that's the field content of our gauge theory. Now we need to know our moment map equations. Uh, and again, those are basically given by the self-duality, anti-self-duality equation with the caveat that we now have some FI parameters, which are gauge invariant, um, even though they weren't gauge invariant before we did the orbifold projection, having done the orbifold projection that reduces our gauge symmetry. And so now we have some new parameters, which are gauge invariant. Uh, and in the T-dual D six brain frame, um, those, those parameters are just coefficients of certain delta functions in, in this uh, equation, um, which are located at the fixed points of the ZQ action. So um, the idea then is, well, K3 is going to um, be a moduli space of connections which are generically anti-self-dual, um, except they're singular at the, the fixed points of the torus with certain prescribed singularities given by these, co these FI parameters. Um, uh, a fancier way to say this is that K3 is the hyperkiller quotient of this infinite dimensional flat space of equivariant SUQ connections on the dual torus um, by the group of equivariant gauge transformations. Um, so, uh, okay, um, we can count the number of parameters that are present in this construction. Um, so we get uh, for Q equals two, we have uh, 16 fixed points. So each fixed point contri contributes a triple of FI parameters. In addition, we have 10 moduli um, for the metric on the torus. Uh, so that adds up to 58, which is indeed the um, number of moduli uh, uh, in, in K3 metrics. And similarly, uh, for Q not equal to two, the count works differently, um, but, but uh, one ends up getting the, the, again, one has all of the parameters one needs for K3 metrics. So uh, for large values of these eta, etas, um, the, uh, one, this moduli space should, should still be K3. So, so one should be able to prove um, that uh, using this construction that, um, uh, one can get a K3 surface with any value of the periods just because these etas are basically the same as the periods of the K3 surface. Um, but uh, this construction is particularly useful when the etas are small because then you're close to an orbifold limit and so you can do a perturbation theory. So uh, the starting point, let, let me describe that perturbation theory now. So the starting point for that is uh, to find the moduli space with vanishing FI parameters. Um, so as, as in the T4 case, we can re restrict to the um, zero modes because of KK masses and gauge transformations. Uh, and then the um, moment maps and gauge transformations allow us to um, uh, put U and V into these canonical forms. Um, so we just have two remaining moduli, U and V. 
uh, and then using up the last bit of remaining gauge symmetry, um, we have the ZQ um, projection on U and V as expected. So here U and V are gonna be coordinates on our K3 surfaces, um, which are gonna be embedded into this infinite dimensional flat space. Uh, and then lastly, um, so for T4, large gauge transformations um, identified uh, were responsible for compactifying the moduli space. Uh, now they're not exactly large, but they're large-ish. So we call them quasi-large. Uh, um, yeah, just due to the you know, complicated topology of all the gauge groups, they turn out to be in connected components. But uh, okay, anyways, <laughs> they, uh, they implement this compactification of the moduli space. Okay, so uh, let's now turn on small values of C and uh, see if we can find a perturbation theory that um, describes the resolution of these K3 or orbifolds to smooth K3 surfaces. So let's uh, parametrize the, um, the C deformed zero modes uh, as the zeroth order values plus some change and we'll require the change to be orthogonal to the zeroth order values because otherwise we could just reabsorb that into our original zeroth order values. Um, and uh, our goal now will be to solve for all of the, um, U, the KK modes as well as the change in the zero mode um, in, in some gauge. Um, and that will allow us to carve K3 out of this infinite dimensional flat space. Uh, and for simplicity, uh, we'll, we'll focus on doing this at first order in C, but um, I'll, I'll explain how to generalize this to higher orders. Um, ah, okay, well, suppose inductively that you know the new minus one to order approximation, um, then uh, uh, let's write the new to order approximation um, as the known new minus one to order plus some small change. Um, then we can write the moment map equations um, in terms of uh, uh, just in terms of the first order values of these delta u's, um, and uh, the moment map equations decouple into infinitely many equations, each involving only finitely many variables. Um, so most of the uh, these KK modes don't talk to each other at first order in delta u n, and furthermore, there, there's a natural gauge choice uh, which shares those features. So um, explicitly, here are the um, complex, real, complex and real moment map equations, as well as the gauge fixing condition, uh, and uh, these just this is just infinitely many um, decoupled finite dimensional linear algebra problems. Um, uh, so so we just want to solve for the delta u's um, uh, in terms of the 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 these c nu's. Um, which are just some some uh, some, uh, some matrices which are constructed out of the um, lower order approximations that we've already inductively found. Um, okay, so yeah, so explicitly here are the C news. They're they're just constructed out of the fields that we already found. Uh, so the solution then, it, um, okay, I don't want to unpackage all this notation, but uh, you know, it, it's it's here just to convince you that we did we did indeed solve this. Uh, so, given the um, previous orders, you can uh, plug them into this simple formula, and and you get the the correction, the newth order correction. Um, so you can just again keep iterating this procedure ad infinitum and get higher and higher orders in C. Um, okay. Uh, we can repackage what we were just doing in terms of solving an integral equation. Um, uh, let, let me move one slide forward and then we'll jump back to that integral equation. So the, the idea is um, the moment map equations are, say uh, the self-dual part is get, of the curvature is given by some delta functions. Well, we can rearrange that equation to say um, uh, the, um, the self-dual part of the, um, Covariant derivative with respect to the zeroth order connection of the full connection is given by a delta function plus um, the nonlinear part of the curvature in the, the correction terms. Uh, and so um, if we add a Green's function for this d plus um, b orb uh, linear operator, um, 
then we could just write B is the convolution of Green's function with the right-hand side, um, which itself involves B, but then you can just do the iterative procedure I described on in the previous slides, where you convolve the Green's function with the zeroth order approximation to get a first order approximation. You convolve the Green's function with the first order approximation to get the second order approximation, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now you can uh, see what's going on here. This is exactly that procedure. We're just convolving this Green's function um, with the previous order um, uh, uh, right-hand sides of that nonlinear equation. So, um, right, we're using our ability to solve some linear PD, some linear uh, PDE in order to um, solve this nonlinear PDE. Now, I should say that um, formally this works, and that, that's enough to read off BPS spectra, and it even literally works for the first couple orders, but um, eventually, if you iterate this enough times, uh, then you're going to start getting UV divergences. Uh, it, it's um, physically clear how to UV regulate them uh, using a, a heat kernel regulator. Um, and, uh, and if you take that regulator to zero each uh, to be smaller and smaller each time you iterate, then uh, this should converge to the right answer. But that that making that mathematically rigorous is somewhat difficult, and that that's uh, the source of some of the an new analysis that that we've been developing um, the past many months. Okay, so uh, but you know at the level of just using this numerically. Um, you don't need it to be mathematically rigorous. You can just do it and, and see that it works. OK, uh, so um, now let's plug those, um, those values of the connection into the Kähler forms in order to read off the smooth Kähler forms um, order by order in C. So uh, these are the Kähler forms on the infinite dimensional flat space of connections on the torus. Uh, and then we just plug um, plug the the first order approximations into the Kähler forms, and this is the um, first order correction that you get. Um, so uh, okay, and then if you use those first order approximations to the Kähler form to compute the metric, uh, that works. You can compute the complex structures. You can compute the Ricci tensor and find that it vanishes, which is very satisfying. Uh, similarly, the complex structures squared to minus one and satisfy the algebra of, of uh, quaternions. OK, so that's everything I wanted to say about this classical construction via hyperkiller quotients. And then the last section here is relating those two constructions. Um, again, sort of you should think of this as, uh, as in mirror symmetry. We're going to um, use the classical quote unquote easy side uh, in order to extract um, quantum instanton corrections to the moduli space from the hard side. Um, so the way that we're going to do this uh, is via a two-dimensional Poisson resummation um, over the lattice of KK modes um, uh, indexed by the momentum on the torus. Uh, and this, we're going to do a two-dimensional Poisson resummation that's motivated um, by the uh, SYZ picture of mirror symmetry, where we're, we're supposed to be thinking of dualizing the fibers of the torus. Um, furthermore, we'll set the um, C, one of the Xs, the C showing up in the F term to zero. Uh, uh, that corresponds to what I said at the beginning of the talk in, um, that we'll um, be solving for the BPS spectrum at orbifold points and we'll only be smoothing out the metric using the real FI parameter, not the complex FI parameter. Okay, so this is the answer that one gets after Poisson resumming. Um, where these Fs are those same functions that I mentioned uh, over here. Um, so, so just by comparing the general form that the Fs should take with the explicit form of the Fs um, that we get by uh, Poisson resumming, um, we can read off uh, some, of, some of the BPS spectra. Uh, so, um, right, so at the order that we're working at, uh, the Fs only depend on the type of singular fiber um, corresponding to a BPS state. And uh, physically, that means that we're not seeing those fancier string webs that um, bounce off, that involve multiple different singular fibers. At this order, we're only seeing the infinite copies of CFT spectra. 
Um, so, you know, if you continue to our, our procedure of iterating this to higher and higher orders in C and comparing the two sides, then you should be able to extract the entire BPS spectrum. And we hope to do that in the future. Um, but at, at the present order already, one gets infinitely many constraints on the CFT spectra, which as I mentioned in the minahan nemeshansky case are unknown. Um, so this involves ar arbitrarily large values of the imprimitivity um, and, the, and the electric and magnetic charges of the BPS states. Um, and you know, it's sort of remarkable that one for arbitrary, yeah, the, there's just a tremendous amount of regularity in these BPS spectra um, where despite the fact that the BPS spectra get very complicated, um, in these minahan nemeshansky theories, they satisfy these very, um, if you package them in terms of these Fs, then they satisfy some very nice simple identities. Um, and we've indeed uh, 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 compared those, uh, those predictions with the known BPS spectrum of SU2 and F equals four, um, as well as with all available data from um, ha Hollins and Knightsky, as well as Hollins, Howe and Knightsky on the minahan nemeshansky theories. And, uh, and um, our predictions match with what they had and then give infinitely many new predictions. Um, so yeah, basically Hall, these papers found the exact spectra for certain gauge charges and for certain small values of the imprimitivity, um, whereas our results give um, constraints on the entire BPS spectrum for arbitrarily large imprimitivity and arbitrary gauge charges, but um, the price we pay for that is at first order in our perturbation theory, the constraints so far are pretty weak. Um, so they're sort of complementary results. Um, okay, one other interesting uh, result um, that I sort of breezed past uh, is in the, the for the, um, the Z4 singular fiber associated to the minahan nemeshansky theory, um, one of the ingredients in this formula is the F associated to the, the SU2 and F equals four singular fiber. And similarly, the SU2 and F equals four and E6 Menahan Nemeshansky functions show up in the E8 Menahan Nemeshansky function. So uh, you might wonder if that's, um, so, so yeah, physically the reason that happened is because the, um, the uh, these different types of singular fibers show up in the same, um, uh, the same F theory compactifications. So, you know, T2 mod Z6 has different types of singular fibers. And so uh, the hyperkiller quotient, P Poisson resumming the hyperkiller quotient results just hap show, turns out to um, uh, show that you get this sort of relationship. And uh, uh, like I said, we've only worked so far at leading order, but by thinking about how the structure of these functions sh should arise, um, we conjecture that um, there should be exact relationships that hold at all orders relating the BPS spectra of these different CFTs. And again, these um, are pretty powerful conjectures that are, are satisfied by all of the uh, results of um, uh, Knightsky et al. And um, geometrically, you, you might think of this back in, in this Coulomb branch construction as a consequence of the fact that um, for when you make these specializations of these parameters, uh, what these moduli spaces are, um, cover the, the on the left, um, uh, let's see, the moduli spaces on the right cover the moduli spaces on the left. And so, um, so, so the metrics are, are related to each other when you make these specializations of the parameters. And so, yeah, because the BPS spectra determine the metrics, then there have to be relationships between the BPS spectra. Okay, uh, let's see. So I told you that, I told you that. Yeah, we have obtained some new BPS state counts as well as infinitely many constraints on the entire BPS spectra. Um, and in, yeah, uh, uh, in future work, we hope to get the entire BPS spectra not just of the CFTs, but also of the little string theories. Um, so that, that's what one needs in order to get the K3 metrics. Um, and uh, um, right, and then we've conjectured these relationships between the BPS spectra of the various CFTs. Okay, uh, and as I said before, um, 
at the order to which we're working so far, we don't see more the more interesting BPS spectra that look like this that involve different types of singular fibers. Um, so that that's something to look forward to at higher orders. Okay, let me wrap up. Uh, so uh, hypercalar quotient yields computationally useful explicit analytic expressions for K3 metrics near torus orbifold limits. They secretly encode the solution to a little string theory BPS state counting problem, which has a number of mathematical reformulations uh, as either open string chromov wooden counts, or if you geometrically engineer the little string theory as Donaldson Thomas counts on some auxiliary non-compact threefold. Uh, in particular, there are piecewise constant lists of integers hiding inside of K3 metrics, which is uh, sort of a, a neat surprise. Um, uh, similarly, we find characters of various representations um, uh, and uh, we find, okay, uh, via string dualities, we can recast this BPS state counting problem in terms of a form that aligns with uh, predictions from mirror symmetry. Um, right, so one thing I haven't stressed throughout this talk is that these constructions are valid in overlapping but distinct regimes. The control parameter here is um, your distance from the semi-flat limit, um, whereas the control parameter here is your distance from the orbifold limit. And so by working in the overlapping regime, one can read off the BPS spectra, but then that will in turn determine metrics um, away from orbifold limits that are but still near um, semi-flat limits. Um, so, so that's sort of an interesting conceptual point. Um, there are other physical approaches uh, and mathematical approaches to determining these BPS spectra, but um, I, I think this procedure is probably the uh, one most likely to work in the near future. Um, so the, these connections are more interesting going in reverse where we, we have predictions for all of these other uh, formalisms. Um, even without most of the BPS state counts, as I mentioned, there, there are some exponentially good approximations just accounting for the lightest known BPS states. Um, uh, it would be nice to understand the direct relationship between the two formalisms I described here. There, you know, there are integral equations showing up on both sides, um, but we didn't directly relate the integral equations. We went, we related, we computed the um, Kähler forms and related those to each other. Um, so it would be interesting if they can be more directly related to each other. Uh, okay, the, and then I just want to mention some generalizations. So um, the same formalisms work for, you know, ALF, ALG, ALH, K3. And in fact, the analysis is much easier in some of those cases. So we're using them as warmups. Um, one, physically, one should be, it, it seems likely that one can um, generalize to, um, many if not all known compact hypercalar manifolds. Um, Poisson resumming other times is you know, mathematically possible. Um, and so uh, it seems likely that those will yield um, corresponding instanton expansions uh, in other problems. And lastly, uh, this, this is a generalization we're quite excited about. Um, by breaking half, as, half of the supersymmetry in this problem, uh, uh, this classical construction seems like it should still allow one to compute superpotentials of D brains in um, torus orbital folds, uh, which are now Calabi L threefold orbital folds, um, and uh, again um, relate superpotentials in those compactifications to open string Gromov Wigner brains. Okay, uh, let me stop there. Thank you, Max, for the very nice talks. And this is question for the questions and comments. So are there any questions? So I have one question regarding this uh, conformal BPS spectra. So you are saying that uh, those spectra are, uh, they don't, uh, so there will be no world crossing for this kind of CFT BPS spectra. So I'm just wondering whether this uh, moduli space or K3's uh, surface has a reason where only the old BPS spectra are given by the CFT BPS spectra. 
are there any such reasons? Um, I don't believe so because mm -hmm. the um, yeah the there are always going to be various type, different singular fibers, and so the um, there will always be more complicated BPS states that involve string webs that end on different singular fibers. Okay. So one can decompactify the base in order to just isolate a single singular fiber, but then one is computing, uh, you know, an ALG metric, say, um, like a Higgs bundle moduli space metric, um, instead of uh, a K three metric. All right. Okay. Thank you. Mm, more questions? Uh, can I ask one? Yeah, please. Uh, so you, today you focus on four-dimensional hyperkähler space. Can uh, can you actually do this for higher dimensional ones? Uh, yeah, this is a great question. Um, the uh, the hyperkähler quotient formalism it's it, it involves the development of new physical technology. Um, uh, uh, but the this little the little string theory um, very directly generalizes to those examples. Um, so you know Hilbert schemes of points on K three uh, or T four um, that should Im immediately generalize. And uh, yeah, it's sort of interesting in the strong math community that there's been a lot of work studying the Strominger Yao Zaslow conjecture um, for the Claude Yao threefold case. But for these Hilbert schemes, um, the, the, they're um, Physically, what what's what, instead of counting holomorphic disks, one should be counting something like holomorphic cylinders with multiple boundaries now. Um, and so uh, the the yeah the geometry problem enumerative geometry problem there is uh, is interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, ultimately we hope to be able to develop both sides uh, of this of these constructions. But th this one will I think be harder to develop in that in that case. Thank you.